this morning. He certainly has given us something worth living for. This time our little ones can be dismissed. I know they're excited to go learn of our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As the little ones make their way out. Those who are going to stick with us for a little while, if you'll make your way to the book of Titus this morning. Titus chapter number 2. Titus chapter number 2 this morning. Pray this message would be an encouragement to us, uh, convicting, if needing, convicting, and encouraging to our hearts as a Christian this morning. Uh, Titus chapter number 2 is where we'll find our place in God's precious word. And as I think about encouragement, encouragement is such a blessing, isn't it, to have folks in our lives who encourage us daily. I'm so thankful for this church who has been an encouragement to me uh, since I was probably about five years old. You're just a a great group of people who love one another and love our Lord. And here this morning, we're going to see some encouragement from the Word of God. And I pray that it will help us in our life that you and I live. Certainly, there are days to where we need encouraging more than others, it seems like. Listen, if you're honest, and if I'm honest, there's times in life to where we can just get plumb down, plumb run down. But it's wonderful that we can turn to the Word of God and have encouragement. We can turn to the prayers that we offer to the Lord. Listen, he'll encourage us in prayer. What a blessing that is. As we think about encouragement this morning, no greater encouragement than to know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to know him personally today, to know that God sent his son to die on a cross for our sins, to be buried and rose again the third day. What an encouragement today to think on that. So this morning, May we see a few encouraging thoughts from the Word of God to help us in life. Encouraging words that can help us make preparations in life. Preparations in life. Notice with me in Titus chapter number 2 in verse number 11 is where we'll be beginning our reading. Titus chapter 2 verse number 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. I'd like to bring a message entitled this this morning, Prepared for Takeoff. Prepared for Takeoff. Let us pray together. Father, Lord, we love you today. And Father, we're grateful for this moment in time that you have provided for us. Lord, to study your word. Father, to be encouraged by your word. Father, I pray today that that's exactly what would happen in our lives, Father, that we would uh, heed your word and, Lord, allow it to uh, be soaked into our souls this morning. And, Lord, change us if we need changing. Help us if we need helping. Lord, there may be one that's in this congregation this morning or one that's listening by way of live stream, the avenues you've provided for us that may be lost. Father, we pray for that soul today, Lord, that they would see their need. And Lord, that your Holy Spirit would convict their heart today. And Father, they would be prepared for the events we're going to speak about today. So Lord, you know the needs. Father, you know your congregation. Lord, these are your people. So Father, whatever need, whatever burden there is today, Father, I pray we would be comforted from your word. Lord, we love you. And we thank you, Father, for loving us. In Jesus' precious name, we do humbly pray. Amen. There's a little girl named Julie. And Julie was just a young thing. And she had an older brother named Johnny. Now, there was quite an age gap. The age gap between my brother and and myself is four years. And I think that's pretty much the national average or close to it. But Johnny and Julie, there was a 15-year age gap. So by the time Johnny was 20 years old, he's gone through high school, he's gone through uh, a trade school. Little Julie's five years old. 
Now, she's looked up to Johnny her whole life. She loves her older brother. He, she idolizes her older brother. She cares for her older brother. But there came a time in the time that Johnny and Julie lived that Johnny was going to have to leave home. And Johnny was going to go out and forge a career for himself. And he had to sit little Julie down and say, Sister, you know, listen, I, Johnny's got to leave. I've got to go away. And in those days, it wasn't like the days that we lived to where technology can connect us instantly. But Johnny said, listen, I'm going to a far city, and I'm going to be gone for quite a while. Don't be sad. I promise you I will come back and see you. I'm going to come back for you one day and be here for you and love you. Listen, I may even take you to my new house that I'm going to build. So Julie, with tears in her eyes, she hugs her big brother Johnny, and Johnny leaves. Day after day, Julie would press her little cheeks against the window and look out the window at the sidewalk in front of their house, longing for the day that Johnny would return, longing for the moment that she would see her big brother and she could give him a hug. She even had her a little suitcase packed. Now, Sarah, my daughter, she's done silly things like that before. She's packed suitcases and things. But that's what little Julie did, and day after day. And her mom and dad would say, Julie, quit obsessing over that. Listen, he's going to be gone for a long time. We don't know when he's coming back. You don't have to look out the window every morning. Listen, he'll come when he comes. But Julie was determined to look. And every morning she would peer out of those windows down that sidewalk until one Sunday morning. Julie looks out, probably had oatmeal smeared on her face where she had been at the table. And she looks out that window and she sees a familiar figure coming her way. And it was her brother Johnny. He had returned. And he'd come and he gives her a big hug and she loves her brother and he loves her. And he asked her a question. He said, did you look for me every day? And she said, I did. I did. And boy, that's a heartwarming story as we think about our siblings. I love my brother. I'm certain if you have a brother or sister, you love your brother and sister. Even our young people, I know you squabble and complain, but you love your siblings. But boy, oh boy, that paints a picture for us today of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen, he's gone to heaven to prepare us a place. And my friend, he is coming back. We don't know the hour. We don't know the day. We don't know the time. But we as Christians ought to be encouraged to look daily because he's coming. He's coming. And he's going to come and get us. And all this mess and all this condition that our world is in, he's going to pluck us out of this mess one of these days. And I long for that day. And I pray that you long for it as well. What a blessing it is to know that truth. So this morning, as we think about Jesus Christ, the blessed hope of humanity, is returning one day. That is no doubt. Listen, this preacher, there is no doubt in my mind that Christ is coming back and he's going to return. The question that we need to ask, are we prepared? Are we prepared? So this morning, may we see a few encouraging reminders of the grace that God has in his love, in his guidance, and glory as we prepare for Christ's return. Because one of these days, he's going to call us away. And we ought to be prepared for takeoff because it's going to happen. The book of Titus, a very interesting book. I love the book of Titus. This is a pastoral epistle. What does that mean, preacher? It's written to a pastor, just like First and Second Timothy. Uh, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of God, penned these epistles to these men to help encourage them, to guide them in life. And can I say it's just as applicable today? Well, pastor, do you have to be a pastor to read Titus? Absolutely not. There's nuggets in there for all of us, for all of our admonition, for all of our encouragement in life. And Titus is a great book. I would encourage you, Christians, read chapter number two today on what the Lord had told Paul to tell Titus to preach to these folks who are at Crete. You see, Titus had spent a lot of time with Paul, and Paul had left him behind in Crete to pastor this church. He entrusted this group of believers with Titus. And now Paul's writing him a letter, and he's going to encourage him and instruct him on some things to say. Now, the first portion of this chapter 
we see that he is to exhort them with doctrine. He is to give them the truth. And listen, can I say something? That's what we need today is truth. We need doctrine. He's told to exhort the older men of the church to be there, to be encouraged, to live right, to live holy, to live just. He encourages the older ladies of the church to do the same thing. And then he encourages them to encourage the younger ladies of the church. And then he speaks to the younger men of the church. Boy, Paul come out with a shotgun effect on this one. He was showing everybody how we ought to live. And then he hits Titus himself. He gives the preacher, the pastor, some encouragement and some uh, guidelines in life. The slaves of that day or servants of that day, he mentions those as well. Listen, he hits every person and showing them how they ought to live. And then we see a little bit of a change in tide here. We see him kind of switch gears in verse number 11. And that's where we'll draw our message from today. But just the context, I wanted us to see what this letter is about. It's about doctrine. It's about encouragement. And Paul is certainly encouraging Titus here. And Christian, we ought to be encouraged today from this precious word, from this precious book this morning. Notice with me, if you will, the first thing I think we notice, we see God's grace in his gift of love. Verse number 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Paul's been laying out this exhortation through the inspiration of the Lord. He's been encouraging Titus. And now we see this turn and the groundwork has already been laid on some of the things that Titus ought to be doing, that the men ought to be doing, that the ladies ought to be doing. And then we see a promise here, a promise of love. Can I say something? It took the love of God for him to do what he's done for each of us. It took love. The grace of God poured out to humanity by his son Jesus Christ through love. He, he loves us this morning. I think about this gift that he has poured out, this gift of love and for the grace of God that bring us salvation. Boy, oh boy, what a gift. In your life, you can probably remember a gift, maybe husbands and wives, uh, children. Listen, you can remember a gift that maybe your spouse has given you that just wowed you. Wow, just knocked your socks off. Maybe children, you can remember a Christmas that maybe mom and dad gave you something and it's just an amazing gift. And when you think about a gift, it's hard to top that gift, right? I have one of those in my life. When my brother and I were young children, I've shared this story with you. It was a Christmas, and listen, it was one of the few Christmases that we actually had snow, and you know I'm a snow nut, and I love it, and boy, I was in high cotton, if you will, but it had snowed outside, and my mom and dad, we had unwrapped presents that morning, and uh, we began our day, and mom's going to fix breakfast. Boy, don't you love mom's breakfast on a Christmas morning? Well, I remember uh, we had an old shed down in the bottom of the, their yard, in the very bottom. And it was snow, and it was a deep snow that day. And My mom and dad said, hey, Matthew and David, I need you all to go down to the freezer. That's where our freezer was. And they had raised some pigs with Brother Paul. and So we had fresh sausage and bacon and fat back and all that kind of stuff that probably hurt you years down the road. But uh, they sent us down there to grab some sausage and bacon. And I'll be honest with you, we were complaining all the way down there. I'll be honest, I was. I was begrudging it. Man, I'm, in my, I'm getting my britches wet. Hadn't any breakfast yet. Can you play with our new toys? So we get down to this building, and we had to scoop the snow out of the way so we could open the door, so we're frustrated even more. And we opened the doors to that building, and in there sat a four-wheeler. Mine's blown. When I go back to the greatest gift, that's what I remember. We, we loved that four-wheeler. We, we rode it to the tires were just bald. I mean, just bald. But I can go back to that memory in my life, and I'm certain you have a memory like that as well. But can I say, all those gifts pale in comparison to the gift that God gave humanity in his son, Jesus Christ. This gift that he poured out for you and I. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but hath everlasting life. The greatest gift 
given to humanity. Now notice there's a few things we see about this gift. Notice this gift has a path. The path is grace. Grace. Verse number 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Now, I'll tell you, grace is a hard one to wrap our minds around. It's a hard one. Listen, I have books by, by great men, uh, you know, who are far more brilliant than I'll ever be, than I could ever aspire to be. And grace is something that I think we struggle understanding just how good God is and how his grace is manifested to us because I tell you, it's hard to see this love, and I found one quote to help us to get a generic definition of grace this morning. Harry Ironside, a great preacher of the past, he said this. He said, grace is the very opposite of merit. So it's the opposite of trying to earn something. Grace is not only undeserved favor, but it is favor shown to the one who has deserved the very opposite. Can I say that's me? I deserve the very opposite of what Christ did for me, the grace that God poured out to me. I deserve the opposite. Another writer said, grace is receiving God's absolute best when we deserve the absolute worst. Well, that's a good definition of grace, isn't it? Grace is everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. That's what grace is. And God poured this grace out for salvation for you and I. What a gift. What a gift this morning. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. He is a gift poured out to us. We can't work our way to heaven. We can't earn it. We can't buy merit. Listen, if we were trying to earn a badge to do something, no, we can't do that. We can't buy our way to heaven. We can't uh, scale the fence. Listen, it is only by the grace of God through faith that you and I can have salvation. And that grace is poured out in his love. I, I think back in times of my life before I was saved, and I certainly didn't merit salvation. But can I say, I think back in times of my life since salvation, since I've been saved, that the grace of God is present in my life. And I don't deserve the forgiveness that he's applied to my account. But he's a good God, and he's a great God, and I'm thankful for his grace this morning. Not only do we see a path, but we see provision. Notice what the Bible says. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. To all men. The provision here. That word appeared, it means to bring to light. I, I think about as you go out in, in your house at night and maybe you hear a, a noise. I know most of us that live out in the country. Listen, you hear a, a strange noise at night. You're going to pull out that big mag light flashlight. And you're going to shine that baby. And you're looking right. Well, whatever you see is being brought to light, whether it's a coyote or a raccoon or a possum that's getting in your trash. That happens. But it's brought to light. Well, the Bible here is saying that salvation has been brought to light for all men. For all men. It's available to all men. Praise God for that. That all men is everyone. He didn't say it's uh, verse number 11, for the grace of God to bring salvation appear to all men except this color person or except uh, this person who is from this place on the planet or uh, except for uh, this nationality no 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 it's for all men it's for all men and what a provision that is first timothy 2 4 who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth second peter 3 9 the lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but is long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I want to read that again for just a moment. I like that word long-suffering. Because, my friend, if you're here this morning and you're lost, I want you to understand that the grace of God is long-suffering. He has given you one more opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He's long-suffering. The Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but His Long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. My friend, God does not want to see you go to hell. That is not the will of God. Now, you can make a choice to end there, but the right choice would be to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this hour. 
today, right now, this moment. Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we see that there's a path, there's a provision, but there's also a price in this gift. And the price we notice down in verse number 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Notice, he gave himself for us. Christ left heaven's abode. Things that we know, we understand that. But my friend, we need to be reminded of these thoughts every now and again. Christ left it all for you and I. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes are you healed. Listen, he took the payment for you and for me. The price that was on our head, Christ paid for with his life, with his blood, through the grace that's poured out to us. He paid the price of redemption for our souls. His love through grace. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom you have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches in his grace. 1 Peter 2, 24, who his self own, bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. It's a familiar passage, isn't it? He's paid it all for you and I. He paid that sin debt that you and I owe. 1 John 2, 2, and he is the propitiation of our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Here, we've noticed this morning, this first prong, if you want to call it a prong, is we see God's grace in his gift of love. God gave it all for you and I because he loves us. And through his grace, this morning, you can have salvation. You can be set free. You can be heaven bound you'll just trust him today so notice secondly we see the gift of love but notice his guideposts of living his guideposts of living verse number 12 teaching us that deny, denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world here we notice that after salvation after we're born again the grace of God continues and teaches us how we ought to live through his word, through the prompting of the Holy Spirit in our lives. God has set guideposts or perimeters in our life to help keep us in track. I like to hike. I used to hike a lot more than I do now. I know that we have several in our church who hike daily. Praise the Lord for that. That is awesome to see that. But when you go hiking, there's a certain uh, guidepost or there may be a blaze on a tree or a marking on a tree to keep you on the right path in life or the right path in the trail that you're hiking. Now, I remember a few years ago, I really wanted to hike on the Appalachian Trail. It's the trail that runs from Georgia to Maine, and you can walk the whole way through. I'd never seen it before in my life, so Nicole and I, we were out and about. And we rode somewhere up in the center of Virginia, and we found the Appalachian Trail. Because I just wanted to say, and hey, I'm telling you this morning, I've had my feet on the Appalachian Trail. Haven't hiked it all the way through. But I've had my feet there. But we walked a short distance down this trail. And I'd done research, and I knew what the blaze looked like. I knew what I was looking for. And we come to a trailhead to where about eight different trails were joining together. It was a junction. And I tell you, if you wasn't looking for the right guidepost, you could get off trail. you get off track. End up where you didn't want to go. And can I say, in our Christian life, we ought to be looking for that guidepost, which is the Word of God. We ought to be listening for the prompting of the Holy Spirit, that guidepost in our life. And He'll direct us on how we ought to live. God has given us that help. Notice what the Bible says in verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly Lust. The first guidepost we'll see here this morning, now there's many, many in the Word of God, is deny. Is deny. That word deny means to not accept. It means to reject, to refuse something that is offered. And here, what, what do we see that we're denying? Ungodliness and worldly lust. When we think about ungodliness, oftentimes we think about something that is just atrocious. Murder. Rape. 
robbery, all these things. That's ungodly. But can I say that anything that is contrary to God is ungodly? A thought, an attitude, disobedience in the least is ungodly. It's not godlike. So here, the Bible is telling us, uh, Paul is telling Titus to tell the people, is telling us today, deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Well, what is worldly lust? It's a desire, it's a craving, a longing for the world. It's wanting what the world has to offer. And I tell you, we're in a war today, Christians, with that. The world wants to draw us in, however it may grab us. But the Bible is telling us plainly here on this guidepost to deny that, to turn away from that. The Bible says in James 4, 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Listen, we've been taught. We've been educated. We're Christians. We're born again. We're heaven bound. But can I say oftentimes we need a, another module in life, another a reminder in life, if you will, to encourage us of these things. Because life is a grind. And I'm telling you, you, you get stuck in a, in a spiritual rut, and the next thing you know, you're doing things you didn't ever think you would ever do before. But we ought to be diligent to deny. I, I think about Lot here. Lot here, we remember he's with Abraham. And man, he could have went anywhere he wanted to go. Had any field he wanted to choose. But where did Lot place his eyes? Sodom. He planted himself there. He looked to this place. Before long, he's right outside the gate. Before long, he's behind the gate. Before long, he's sitting at the gate welcoming people in as they come to this wicked place because he didn't deny worldly lust. He didn't have the guideposts in life. And my friend, if, if we're not careful, we can go down the same path. We can go back on the same path. It's not only denying, but it hearing. We ought to adhere. We ought to adhere to the word of God. Notice the Bible says we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. We ought to live right. And I love how God just put that right there for us in this present world. The present world, when Paul wrote Titus, is the same present world that you and I live in today. Things haven't changed. The Bible's not outdated. We ought to still be living godly, soberly. As his word commands us. The Bible says in James 4, 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Colossians 3, 2 says, Set your affection on the things above, not on the things of the earth. We find ourselves in this battle daily. Every day. Battling the flesh. A battle of our minds. A battle of our attentions. A battle of our affections. But as we ponder the grace of God, that he provided the salvation that you and I have. He provided the guideposts that you and I have. Where do we find ourselves? If we really self-examine ourselves, if we, if we compare my life with the teaching here, Titus 2, verse number 12, where do I stack up? How, how, do, I, how do I look from a just and a holy God who's looking down on me? How do I stand? Because ultimately we find ourselves looking as Christians for the Lord's return. And praise God, I pray that you're looking for that rapture. I pray you're looking for it every day because I am. But we ought to be ready. First, if you're lost, listen, you need to be saved. You're not getting in. And Christian, what a shame it would be for the Lord to come back and catch us. Not living the way we ought to be living. Sure, our sins are forgiven. They are. But what a shame that would be to find us in that position. So we see God's grace in the gift of love. We see his grace in the guideposts of living. And lastly, we see his grace in his glory in looking. We ought to be looking for his glory. Here, we find one of the great promises in Scripture in verse number 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of, our, of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the encouragement for Christians today. Listen, we have hope. Our God's coming back. He's going to pull us out of this mess, as I've already mentioned. We have seen the grace and the gift of 
uh, the grace and God's gift of love and salvation. We've seen his grace and the guideposts of life. Listen, his grace gives us these standards that we ought to live by. He saves us and he just doesn't turn us out to be wild crazy. Listen, he gives us the scripture to live by, by his grace. And now ultimately we find ourselves looking for the glory of his return, the rapture of the church. I will long for the day, and I, I pray you do as well. To see that sky split, we're out of here. The question would be, are we prepared for takeoff? Because we're going to take off if you're saved. And if you're not, my friend, you're going to be left behind. And what a shame that is. But one day he's bringing us home. The day when our Savior, our triumphant King, our Lord, our Master is returning. Let's notice a few things about this return and appearing of our great God. First, there's proof that he's coming back. Christ spoke the words in John 14, verse number 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. What a promise. From the very word of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul taught of the rapture. A very familiar passage of scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. Verse 13 through 18. I'll read starting in verse number 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. And with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds. To meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We began speaking this morning about comfort. What greater comfort is there than to know that Christ is coming back? What an encouragement today. We see, though, that though there's proof, and there he is, he's coming back, there also needs to be some preparations made. It's an imminent return. Hebrews 10, 37 says, For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. James 5, 8 says, Be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. I'll tell you a little story about a little girl. She was at church, and uh, she heard the preacher preach on the rapture, kind of like this morning a little bit. And they had a meal afterwards, and mom and daughter are talking after the meal, and the little girl says, Mama, you know, I got to thinking about what that preacher said. Do you really think Jesus is coming back? Her mom said, well, yes, honey, of course I do. She said, well, Mama, I've been thinking about this. and Do you think he could come today? Her mom says, well, honey, yes. We, we don't know when Christ is coming, but he's coming. She said, well, Mama, do you think he could come in the next few minutes? Her mom said, well, yeah, honey, I, I think she could. He could come in the next few minutes. She said, well, my mama needs you to do something for me. She said, would you mind brushing my hair? She said, I want to look nice when Jesus comes. Now, that's cute. It really is. But what if all Christians thought like that? What if we all thought like a child thought? Hey, I want to be my best when my king comes. I want to be living my best when my Lord comes. That's the way this child thought. And Christian, that's the way we ought to think. We ought to be prepared for Christ is coming. He's coming. First, we ought to be saved. Listen, that's the basis. That is the first and foremost. Uh, if you're preparing for takeoff, Brother Mike, the pilot, listen, I have no idea what happens when you prepare a plane for takeoff. But whatever the first thing a pilot does, that's the first thing we ought to do as far as our spiritual well-being is be saved, be born again. The Bible tells us, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's every person sitting in this room. But God commended his love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Listen, there is a payment, and he paid it. It was something that was due. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is our God. That's his grace. And then we see that, listen, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
My friend, if that's you this morning, would you call on the name of the Lord to save you? Believe that he died, that he was buried, and he rose again. Listen, he'll save you this morning. That's the first and primary preparation you've got to make if you want to be prepared for the rapture. We understand there's no second chances. It's not going to be the rapture happens, and it may happen today. And Monday morning, you know what? That preacher heard what he said. He's right about that. Friend, there's no second chances on this. Once and for all. So don't leave out of here this morning if you're lost, lost. Make that change today. And Christ can't lie. He's a just and a holy Lord. Jesus said in John 8, 24, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. If you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. That's what Christ said, and he's not a liar. So we've got to get things right if you're lost today. But if you're saved today, listen, we ought to be prepared for the rapture as well. We ought to be active. We ought to be busy. We ought to be serving the Lord. We ought to have fellowship. 1 John 2, 28, now little children... Abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Listen, what a shame that would be to have strife with someone or listen to be bitter against someone or have some other sin that's dwelling in our life that is rooted in our life. Christ comes. Yes, absolutely. You, you haven't lost your salvation. You're going to heaven. But boy, the shame that would bring to be out of the will of God when he comes to rapture us home. I ought to be living a pure life, First John 3, verse number 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not appear, and doth not yet appear that we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Listen, that's the God we serve. We ought to be living a pure, clean life. That's what Paul told Titus to tell the church there at Crete. And my friend, that's what I'm telling us today. I'm telling myself today. Listen, we ought to have a pure life and be rapture ready today. Christian, we ought to be looking for it. We ought to be anxiously anticipating the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what a blessing that is. As we close this morning, We've seen the gift of love, God's grace and the gift of love. We've seen God's grace and the guideposts of life and these guidelines that he has set up for us. We've seen God's grace and the glory that we look for. I want to ask you today, are we prepared? As we think about a pilot out checking the plane and, listen, inspecting, and he's got the flight manuals and all these things, maybe we ought to go over our life today with a fine-tooth comb and make sure we're prepared for departure because, my friend, it's at hand. could be today, could be tomorrow. Listen, it could be 100 years from now. But here's one promise we do know. He is coming back, and we ought to be ready. Now, friend, if you're here this morning and you're lost, I want to plead with you for just a moment. Don't leave out of here lost today. Trust Jesus Christ. His return is imminent. Listen, we're not guaranteed that we can make it out of this parking lot alive. Our life is but a vapor. Would you trust him today? Christian, maybe there's something in your life you need to make right. Would you make it right today so we could be prepared for takeoff? Father, Lord, we love you today. Father, thank you for this morning. Father, thank you for this opportunity, Lord, as we've been able to stand at your pulpit behind your word on your day, delivering a message to your people. Father, would you help us today as we think about the rapture? Father, as we make preparations in our life, Lord, you've not told us when you're coming back. But Lord, we know you are. You're going to send your son, Jesus Christ, to rapture us home. And Father, Lord, would we make changes today if need changes need making. Father, there may be one here today that has a bitter heart. There may be one here today that's dabbling in some sort of sin. Lord, an attitude issue. Father, you know the needs. But Father, we want to meet you in the best shape that we can, Father, as you call us home. So, Father, I pray that even this morning 
we would make changes if need be. And then, Father, we pray for that one lost soul who may be here this morning. Lord, would you convict their hearts even this moment? Father, not guaranteed tomorrow, not guaranteed another breath. Lord, would they see their ever-important need to trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior so they can be ready for departure. Lord, we love you and we thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name, we do humbly pray. Amen. We'd like to thank you for joining us today on our live stream service. We pray that you were encouraged, that you were blessed, and that you were challenged by God's word. If we can be of any assistance to you, please feel free to reach us at our email below. We pray that you have a wonderful day, and God bless.